fun one. This, this is the chapter that has the mark of the beast in it. So when we started going through the book of Revelation, as I said, it's something I have avoided for 10 plus years in ministry because most Christians like to read it, fight, debate, argue, you know, divide churches, go plant new churches, start whole new denominations. We generally don't get along when it comes to uh, the book of Revelation and its interpretation, uh, even though I don't think that was God's intent when he gave John these visions and when he inspired him to write them down. But this would be one of those things. The mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? Is it a tattoo? Is it a social security number? Is it a barcode? Is it a chip that gets implanted in your under your wrist? What, what might the mark of the beast be? How obvious will it be? I mean, we're getting, we're getting close, right? I mean, all we need is for Apple and Visa to get together and they can get some chip and stick it in your brain. And then before you even know you want things, they'll show up on your door from Amazon. And I mean, the packages will be there before you even think of it. And of course, if it was that obvious, all of a sudden, nope, nope, I don't, I don't want that. You're not putting that in me. You're not putting that in my body. Uh, what is the mark of the beast? And it does seem like with every new technology that comes along, Somebody goes back and reinterprets Revelation chapter 13 and says, that's it. And I mean, let's be honest. If it was that obvious, would any of us go, would you get tat, you know, 666 tattooed on your forehead? No, prob probably not. Uh, so, well, let's slog through it. Let's read through chapter 13. If you remember, uh, before we did, right before we read it, though, uh, we mentioned that last week at the end of chapter 12, it says in that last verse that the dragon, uh, that is the dragon who had pursued Israel, who had pursued Mary, who had tried to destroy the Messiah, it says that when he could no longer get to the woman, that he went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So we said when we get to chapter 13, we're going to find out how uh, he makes war on those who follow Jesus, on those who believe in him and keep his commandments. So let's read verse or chapter 13 here in Revelation to find out how the dragon or the devil makes war on us. So starting with verse 1. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon. For he had given this authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is, but he is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell in the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who understand with understand who has understanding, excuse me, let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six six six. This is the word of God for the people of God. 
All right. So this should be fun this morning as we talk about all these crazy animals that are coming up out of the sea. It, it helps to know um, Daniel chapter 7. So if you have a Bible open, if you want to flip back for just a moment to Daniel chapter 7, there are four beasts in Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Daniel receives these visions when, when the Jewish people are in captivity in Babylon. So this is, this is before the time of Jesus from about 586 to roughly 530-something B.C., I think about 539. And during that time, Daniel receives this vision from God. In verses 1 through 8, it's, or sorry, we'll start, uh, verse 2. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning the, up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being and the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back, it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While well, I was thinking about the horns, before me there was another horn, a little horn, which came up among them, and the first of the horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Whenever you study through the book of Revelation, it is hard to limit the number of extra passages that you need to read or, or at least have a, a, a grasp on to start studying through the book of Revelation. So Daniel has four beasts in chapter 7. And it is generally understood during Daniel's time. It was, it was predictive. It was prophetic what he wrote there. Uh, four different kingdoms. And I, I, Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and Rome, if I remember correctly. But that last beast in Daniel chapter 7, a Jewish scholars understood to be the Roman Empire. And then you get to Revelation, and if you'll notice, uh, the four beasts in Daniel sound a lot like this one kind of composite beast from Revelation. Look like a bear, a leopard, and a lion, all put together here in Revelation chapter 13. Well, we had a bear, we had a leopard, we had a lion, and, and an eagle from Daniel chapter 7. So I think what it is, Daniel's in captivity, 586 to 539 BC, around that time. God gives him this vision that takes them forward to the Roman Empire. And then Jesus comes, he's crucified, he's buried, he's resurrected, he ascends to heaven. And then God gives John this vision and says, okay, Daniel got us from his time to here. Now here's this vision to get you from now until the end of the world. And so we have this strange beast that is bear-like, it's lion-like, it's leopard-like. It has ten horns and seven heads. And if you remember last week, whenever you see ten and seven together, think of the Roman Empire. Rome as a city sat on seven hills. Uh, down through the ages or through the course of its history that had 10 significantly powerful emperors, 10 significantly powerful Caesars uh, that ruled the Roman Empire. There were others interspersed, but not all of them quite had the same domination or the same stranglehold on power in the Roman Empire as these 10 did. So think about Rome. And this beast rises out of the sea, which would have made sense to the Jewish people because Rome on the peninsula that is now modern-day Italy would have come from the Mediterranean. So it doesn't have to be a literal bear, leopard, lion mix of an animal coming up out of the sea. This, this is the Roman Empire. And it looks like someone has been mortally wounded. When you look there in verse 3 of this passage. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Now, just stop here for a second. If, we, if when we read through Revelation 13, you thought, man, that all sounds really, really bizarre, because it does sound pretty bizarre. But it's not nearly as hard to understand as we might make it out to be. This is a counterfeit religion, right? This is a counterfeit God. This is a counterfeit world system. 
One of these heads on this beast was wounded, mortally wounded, right? It should have died. This beast should have died. But then the dragon gives the beast life and brings it back to life. Who do we worship who was dead and resurrected and came back to life? We just, we just sang about the power of the cross, right? We, we just stated our faith in the Apostles' Creed, that he descended into Hades on the third day. He rose again from the dead, and he ascended up into heaven. Uh, the devil is parodying God in Revelation chapter 13. Here's a beast, comes up from the sea, should be dead. The, the dragon gives it life. And then what else does the dragon do? He gives him a throne and authority and power. What does God do for his son? He gives him a throne and authority and power, right? Jesus is the one who will rule all nations and all tribes and all peoples and all languages. Well, the devil says, well, I can fake that. Here we go. We got this beast. I'll give him authority. I'll give him a throne. I'll do what God does. And it's right there in verse 2. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a, like a bear's mouth, like a lion's. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. That's, that's exactly what God does for Jesus. Daniel chapter 7. We didn't read to this part, but in verse 14, it says, And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. It's exactly what the devil is trying to do. He's parroting what God has done in Jesus. So, we have this defeated beast that is, let's put it in quotes, resurrected. The dragon gives him authority. He gives him power. And then, when you look over here in verses 11 through 18, we have this second beast that shows up. And John says, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast who was mortally, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. And by the signs that it, that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. All right, so we have a dragon playing God the Father in heaven. We have the first beast who's kind of like Jesus, who should have died and then came back to life and then was given authority and power to rule on the earth. And then we have this second beast who points everybody to the first beast and says, look how amazing that beast is. Uh, you need to worship that beast. This, this, this is the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? Convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The Holy Spirit's job is to work in people's hearts to point them to Jesus, so that you might receive salvation and worship Jesus and Jesus only. What does the second beast do in the world? It's pointing everybody to the first beast, saying, look how amazing that first beast was. He was, he was dead and he lives. You should worship him. Make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. It's a false trinity. How does the devil wage war against those who believe in Jesus? He's doing everything he can to get you to worship someone or something else. That's how. Because if you give up worshiping Jesus, there's no hope left. He's our only hope. He is the only road to eternal life in heaven. And you realize that we are more than halfway through the sermon and we haven't even started talking about the mark of the beast yet. So let's look at that, that last one. This is the part that we all want to debate. What is the mark of the beast? Who is this? Is it a him? Is it a person? Is it not a person? Uh, if you look, if we start there in verse 16, it causes all, all people, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, covering every economic base, every class of people. It causes all people to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the number of the beast or the number of its name. 
This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. This is, by the way, this is another counterfeit that the devil is doing, what God has already done. If you remember back in chapter 7 of the book of Revelation, who marked his people? If you remember back in, in Revelation chapter 7, God marked his people. He put a mark on our forehead saying, they are mine. Those people are mine. 12,000 from every tribe. It says there in verse 3, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Well, here's the devil going around putting a mark on people's foreheads. He's parodying God again. He's imitating God. We've got the devil pretending to be God the Father. We've got the first beast pretending to be God the Son. We've got the second beast pretending to be God the Holy Spirit. And they're out there trying to deceive everybody. And just as God marked the foreheads of his children, uh, so the beast is marking the foreheads of those who he has managed to deceive. All right, so what is it? What is the mark of the beast? Anybody got a guess? Anything you've been taught down through the years? I mean, it is literally, I, I have read this week that it goes from a tattoo on the forehead to your heart. Something as obvious as 666 tattooed on your forehead or on your hand to the condition of your heart. Now, I don't think that it would be quite that obvious as a tattoo on the forehead. I mean, who would honestly go out and get that? I mean, the There'd be some jokers out there who would do it and think it was funny because they didn't believe in anything that the Bible said. But I don't think it's I don't think it's that obvious. I don't think it's that blatantly clear what the mark of the beast is. It has something to do with economics, it has something to do with controlling how you spend money or how you think about money or how you view money. You look there again. It causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark of the beast, that is, the name of the beast, or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Six, six. I think that this is your heart. Where is your heart, your heart at? Are you a me first person? Or are you a others first person? And listen, everything in this world tells you to be a me first person. Everything in this world tells you to look out for number one. Every financial advisor we have ever sat down with, and there are some good ones, but there's, we, Brittany and I have never sat down with a financial advisor that has told us that we need to give to the church. Everything is about saving for the future. Everything is about me first, you first. Look out for number one. Uh, that's not God's, that's not what God wants us to do. God has always been an others first God. Consider others as more important than yourself. Put others' needs above your own. Not a me first God. And here's the real kicker. There, there's a better way to translate verse 18. So when you look there and it says, this calls for wisdom, let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Uh, if you're all still awake and you're still with me, are you ready for a quick Greek grammar lesson? There's no indefinite article in the Greek language. There's no A or an in the English language, right? We talk about a chair, a cross, a pew, a person. In the Greek, that, there, there is no A. So you would just say cross or chair or person. There's a definite article. There's the, right? The chair, the cross, the person. But there's no A. So if we take out the A in verse 18... This calls for wisdom. Let the one who is under understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. It is 666. That changes our understanding, doesn't it? 
Now we're no longer looking for a person with the number 666. If it's not a man, if it's just man, well, that kind of comes back to the heart condition, doesn't it? Are you a me first person or are you an others first person? Are you concerned with God's things or are you concerned with your own things? Because there's this enemy out there telling you that you need to be concerned about yourself. That if you set your mind to it, you can do anything. That you need to look out for number one and make sure that you're taken care of. That you need to... Anybody ever heard it? Were you ever told, you know, I think you just need to put yourself first. Life's been hard. You're not taking care of yourself. You need to put yourself first. Let everybody else go for a minute or two. Focus on yourself. I think that's the mark of the beast, personally. That's, that's me. And like I said... I've read this week anywhere from a tat literal tattoo on the forehead to the condition of your heart. You can pick your own interpretation. I won't force one on you. But what we can say as we finish up here in Revelation chapter 13 is this. It's the response. It's the response to the beast. Did you notice the common theme throughout the whole chapter? Did you, did you pick up on what John is writing? He said it at least four times. How does the world respond to the first beast, the second beast, and the dragon? They worship him. Right? It's a response of worship. That is how the devil is waging war on God's children. Are you going to worship God or are you going to worship someone or something else? You look there in verse 4. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? In verse 8, all the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Verse 12, it exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf. And made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And then verse 15, the second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so the image, of the, so the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. They worshipped, they worshipped, they worshipped, and if they didn't worship, they were killed. Every person that walks on this face of this earth will worship someone or something. Hopefully you choose to worship God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in heaven. Everybody worships something. And Christians, make sure that you are worshiping God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Don't worship anything or anyone else and you will be tempted. We are tempted. We all talk, right? How many of you are concerned about the state that our country is in? Anybody not? Well, we all agree on that. That's good. How many of you have your candidates picked out? Don't worship them. They're not Jesus. But boy, it's tempting to put your faith in a person. How many of you are really happy with what your retirement accounts are doing right now if you are fortunate enough to have them? Do you worship them? Do you watch the stock market? Are you concerned with those monthly returns? It's so easy to worship something or someone else other than God the Father in heaven. It can be anything or it can be anyone. And man, the devil is working hard. He is working hard. And I tell you what, he looks so good. And I don't say that in a good way. I say it in a bad way. He looks so much like God the Father. See, that this if you go to... to 2 Corinthians, you will find that Paul writes that the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light. The devil can look so attractive if you are not guarding your heart and making sure that you are worshiping God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, it is easy to be led astray. So guard your heart. I think the mark of the beast is a condition of the heart. I don't think it's a tattoo. That's me. But just make sure you're not worshiping the wrong things. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time to gather together and to worship you. 
We pray that we would not be deceived. We pray that we would be faithful. We pray that we would, we would have a message to take to the world and that we would not follow after politicians. We would not follow after money. We would not follow after anybody who would distract us from worshiping you. Not even ourselves. We pray that we would put others first and not ourselves first. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you would stand and sing, our song of invitation is, I need thee every hour. If you're able, we will stand and we will sing together verses 1 and 4. Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. I need thee every hour, stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. as we normally do when we have our uh, fellowship lunches after church, we will go ahead. Our benediction will also be our prayer for the food. So when you get over there and the food is ready, uh, you can eat. So let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to worship this morning. We thank you for this time to come together. We pray that you would bless the food uh, over next door in the FLC. Bless it to our bodies. Bless us to your service. Uh, Lord, and just pray that you would be in our midst a time of fellowship and food and, and just enjoying one another's company. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where'er you go. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Take his name with you. Go ahead. 